welcome everybody to the 2016 Virginia Junior Academy of Science Symposium. Mary Washington. Um, just real quick before we get started, I'd like to thank our um, VAS committee chair, Say, over here. And uh, Susan Booth is our um, director, and they both worked tirelessly before this event, uh, really just all year round, to make this event fantastic. Make sure all of you guys uh, get here and have the opportunity to present your research. Um, this is a really exciting year. This is our 75th symposium with the Virginia Junior Academy of Science. Um, so in the past 75 years, um, in the scientific community, we've mapped the human genome, we've found um, a vaccine for the flu, and also, um, oh yeah, tectonic plates. So, if that has happened in the past 75 years, if we found out that we're all floating on um, seas of magma, I think um, the next 75 years are going to be a fantastic ride uh, for the science tech community. So I'm really excited to have all of you guys here today. I'm Ben Rhodes, by the way. I'm the um, president of the uh, student committee for the Virginia Junior Academy of Science. Um, I'd like to introduce right now um, Dr. Wieland. Uh, Dr. Wieland is a professor of biology here at the University of Mary Washington and also um, a representative of the Virginia Academy of Science. So Dr. Wieland would like to come up here. Okay, never mind. Dr. Wieland um, had to attend to an emergency real quick. Uh, he is hosting us, so has many responsibilities right now, but we're going to move on to our uh, message from Senator Tim Kaine. Um, Tim Kaine is a fierce advocate of science education in Virginia and um, is really excited about the symposium, about uh, the Virginia Junior Academy, and um, really wanted to uh, send this message to us, so if we could see that real quick. Hi, I'm Senator Tim Kaine. Welcome to the Virginia Junior Academy of Science 2016 Annual Research Symposium. I'm sorry I can't be here in person tonight, but I want to share some thoughts on the exciting research that you've been up to. Over 700 students and friends from across the Commonwealth of Virginia are here to celebrate your accomplishments as young scientists. Science can be harnessed to improve quality of life on a global scale. It can provide a foundation for the development of language, logic, and problem-solving skills in the classroom. For some of you, science will be your lifelong vocation. Whichever path you choose to pursue, it's clear to me that your passion for scientific research displays a deep appreciation of the natural world around you. The federal government has an important role to play in helping advance scientific research. In the Senate, I co-founded the Career and Technical Education Caucus, which focuses on highlighting the benefits of STEM and career and technical education programs. I've introduced bills that seek to increase access to these programs and encourage more students to consider careers in math and science. I've also been a strong supporter of increased funding for biomedical and scientific research at the National Institutes of Health. NIH serves an invaluable role in scientific research, and we have to continue to invest in its work so we can cure diseases, make breakthrough discoveries, and improve the quality of life, not just for Americans, but for everybody on this planet. We all know that investing in scientific research done by the best and brightest minds will only benefit our country's future success. I'm proud of each and every one of you for advancing science and involving yourselves in research which builds skills that will take you far in life. I wish you all the best with your presentations tomorrow. That was Senator Kane, uh, which we were very grateful to have his um, video. Uh, we invited Governor McAuliffe as well, but he is on a foreign business trip uh, trying to bring jobs to the state of Virginia, so we will excuse him for that. Uh, my name is Sam John, the committee chair for the Virginia Junior Academy of Science, and on behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome each and every single one of you here today. You 
have accomplished a lot to be here at the Virginia Junior Academy of Science Research Symposium. You planned your project, conducted experiments, collected data, interpreted the results, and written an outstanding paper to be accepted to the 75th Annual Virginia Junior Academy of Science Research Symposium. And I would like to congratulate each and every one of you, including the students and teachers and parents who have supported the students' <coughs> efforts uh, in conducting experiments. Now, as Senator Kane said, your journey in science is just beginning in this room. Just like mine did six years ago. Yes, six years ago, I was sitting in those seats right now where you are at. I remember how nerve-wracking it was to stand in front of judges while presenting my research topic. But here I am, still doing research, and now in charge of this Virginia Junior Academy of Science Committee. Although your future path may be different than mine, this Virginia Junior Academy of Science experience will forever be a memory to look back on. And I truly hope that the 75th Annual Research Symposium is a memorable one for each and every one of you. I would like to again congratulate you on accomplishments and wish you best of luck in your presentations tomorrow. Now as the committee chair, I am more responsible for the internal ins and outs of how this committee is being run. That includes revitalizing what we call social media these days. Um, and as you can see, we are videotaping live and also videotaping here in your students' reactions. How can you help? Well, throughout the symposium, starting right now, you can Instagram or Twitter, hashtag VJAS2016, 2016, and we will use, we will pull those photos from you, and we will have a slideshow at the award ceremony Thursday morning for you to enjoy. Also, we would like to, um, I would like to recognize that we need student volunteers. I would like to thank President Ben Rhodes for his uh, doing very well on his presentation. <laughs> and we cannot do what we do without the student volunteers as student officers. They are right now helping setting up cameras, video cameraing uh, what we have today, taking photos and just helping us with ins and outs of what we do in the symposium. So without further ado, I would like to reintroduce President Ben Rhodes in introducing our new incoming officers. So every year we have a uh, slew of officers that come into the um, BJAS Student Committee, um, not the VAS Committee, but the um, BJAS Student Committee. Um, and this year's officer candidates are Yashoda Obama and um, Riona Pereira um, from Maggie Walker High School. Yeah, you guys can stand up. Um, and they will be uh, running for, uh, as co-presidents, um, they're running unopposed. Um, so they will, will likely be your co-presidents next year. Um, we also have um, Ankit Kumar, um, from Godwin High School, I believe. <laughs> running for the position of Secretary of the Virginia Junior Academy of Science and in the position of Editor-in-Chief and Communications, um, Cassie Block from Washington <laughs> High School. And this year we're creating a, a new um, STEM position so that we can have a student uh, representative communicating with the STEM high schools in Virginia and working on um, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics initiatives with um, VJAS. Um, and that um, will be Sarah Jackson. So those are um, the 
candidates for officers for next year. Um, if you guys would like to apply for positions for um, for next year, uh, come and contact me. If you want to send me an email, vjspresident at gmail.com. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and we can get you hooked up. Um, in the handbook, there is procedures for officers. We have tons of regional director positions every year, um, different communications positions, of course, president, vice president, usually. Um, so if you guys are interested in those leadership positions, uh, just contact vjspresident at gmail.com. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Wheeland, who is um, back from his emergency trip um, with the university. Well, uh, I'm just here to welcome you to the University of Mary Washington, and I uh, hope you have a successful meeting here. I'm sorry about the weather, but I guess I didn't have that much cool in that category. But uh, I've been here for about 33 years, well not about 33 years, and this is the first time we've had you on campus. I think we hosted the uh, Virginia Academy back in the 70s one time. But we're glad that you're back. We hope you have a successful meeting, and uh, good luck. All right, so now I'm going to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Mr. Max Lupton. Um, Mr. Max Lupton earned a BS in chemistry from Virginia Tech in 1990 and an MS in chemical engineering at Lehigh University in 1997 and a Master of Engineering from UVA in 2012. His experience includes working on organo organometallic compound synthesis and characterization with air products and chemicals as part of um, the where is this? Naval Surface Warfare Center uh, at Dahlgren. Um, a strong advocate of STEM education and a lifelong learner, Max is Active with, a local, with local maker community, Fred works a local and entrepreneurial group, Fred X Challenge, and he teaches computer programming part-time at Germana Community College. He's currently at the Naval Surface Warfare uh, Center at Dahlgren and has worked on chemical and materials research for the U.S. Navy. So without further ado, Mr. Lovett, you can come up here. projects that go on there and help try and motivate you guys to stay on the path towards uh, science, technology, engineering, and math education. Even if you don't end up being scientists or engineers, I think it's important that everybody in society today gets some exposure to that. And I'd certainly like to see a lot more scientists and engineers. Uh, the ones I work with are great and I would love to see more people join the workforce in that area. So. Um, this is an aerial view of uh, the Naval Surface Warfare in Dahlgren. For those of you that aren't familiar with the area, uh, we're about 25 miles east of here on the Potomac River, about 20 miles south of Washington, D.C. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, please. Oh, wait. I have a clicker. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, Dahlgren is a research base. Uh, most of the people on the base are not military personnel. They're civilian scientists and engineers. We do research on a number of different areas. Um, and uh, the Navy's full acronym, so you'll hear things like RDT, Research, Development, Test, and Engineering. Um, these pictures show some of the uh, areas of research that go on at Dahlgren, and I'll get into those a little later. First, I'm going to give you a little bit of history. Uh, so the reason Dahlgren exists is originally there was a naval proving ground up at Indian Head, Maryland, about 10 or 12 miles north. And in about 1916, they had a few little accidents. Uh, this shows a 16-inch artillery shell that sort of overshot the mark uh, and landed in somebody's front yard and took out part of their porch. Um, Congress at the time decided that this was a, a, an indication they needed to uh, come up with a better facility. Uh, so they moved 
They created the uh, Naval Proving Ground Dahlgren, which changed names a number of times. Most recently, we've been reorganized as uh, the Naval Support Facility at Dahlgren, and uh, the Naval Service Warfare Center Dahlgren Division is the name of the lab that I work in. Um, so some of the areas we work in uh, that have been a focus over the years um, include computational sciences, uh, systems engineering, uh, the research and development of weapon systems, uh, as well as the test and evaluation of those weapon systems. Uh, this is a little overview map of uh, what Dahlgren looks like, and you can see why they would want to have a, uh, a shooting range here. Uh, we have a clear shot from up in the upper left-hand corner where the yellow is all the way down through the green area across the water. Um, at the time, we were uh, moving, we were between World War I and World War II when Dahlgren was founded, and they really wanted to work on naval gunnery. Uh, Dahlgren is actually named after uh, Admiral Dahlgren, who was sort of the father of naval gunnery. Um, so this is a picture, uh, some pictures of the guns that we still do test on the range. Uh, during World War II, Dahlgren was primarily a place for testing uh, guns, as well as uh, munitions, artillery shells, powder, and, and proof testing lots. Um, we still do most of that for the Navy, but the Navy has moved on, and guns are no longer the primary weapons that are used on ships these days. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, testing, so uh, the engineers at Dahlgren like to burn stuff and blow stuff up. Uh, we have another facility that's across Wachota Creek called Pumpkin Neck, uh, or more formally the uh, Explosives Experimental Area, uh, again another acronym. Uh, we do a lot of different tests there involving energetic materials, um, and the reason we do that across the river is because energetic materials can sometimes get out of hand, so we want to have a lot of space between us and anybody else. Uh, so some of the historical highlights in Dahlgren, uh, during World War II and before World War II, uh, the Norton bomb site, which was essentially an analog computer used to guide bombs to their targets, was developed and tested at Dahlgren. Um, some of the very first computing equipment that was used for uh, practical purposes for computing artillery shell trajectories was installed at Dahlgren. This is a picture of Grace Hopper, who was the first female <coughs> admiral in the Navy. Uh, she worked at Dahlgren back in the 1930s as one of the first computer programmers. She invented the language COBOL and is also credited with discovering the first computer bug, which was a lock that got stuck in one of the relays of the early electromechanical relay calculator she was working on. Well, one of the other things that not a lot of people know about Dahlgren is that in the 60s and 70s, they had to do a lot of geodetic studies of the gravitational field of the Earth in order to guide long-range missiles better to their targets. And one of the outcomes of collecting all of this data was they were able to help in the development of the GPS system, uh, which I'm sure all of you in here have GPS receivers on your phones and uh, probably rely on them quite a bit. So some of the early work that led to that was done at all. Um, some of the current areas of development I'm going to talk about in a little more detail involve unmanned vehicles, laser weapon systems, the electromagnetic rail gun, and I'll mention a few things about chemical and biological defense. That's the group I work in, so I have to throw that in there. That's not really a major focus at Dahlgren, but we do get our hands in uh, quite a lot of other things as well. Um, so, unmanned aerial vehicles. I'm sure all of you have bought drones now and you love to fly them around, right? Um, the Navy is very interested in drones as well. Uh, this is a picture of the Scan Eagle. Um, which is a 44-pound drone uh, that's used for observation. It's got various cameras that can be mounted on the front of it. And the reason the Navy's interested in this is because flying manned aircraft is fairly expensive. It puts pilots at risk. Um, and there's a long turnaround time, and manned aircraft don't have the endurance. This drone can stay in the air for 24 hours as long as somebody is uh, at the control. It is actually more or less autonomous. It'll fly a route without having somebody monitor it constantly. Um, some of the technical challenges involving drones, though, the um, reason we still work on them, we haven't solved all the problems. We need them to be more reliable, we need them to be cheaper, um, we need better sensors. Uh, we need to make them a little harder to destroy. On the, on the bottom right there, you see a drone getting hit by one of the laser weapon systems. Uh, the laser weapon system isn't good at taking out larger aircraft, uh, 
but it's pretty good at knocking drones out of the sky, so uh, if the uh, FAA ever gets a hold of them, they'll probably be able to enforce those drone regulations they're putting in place. Um, so there's a lot of research that's going on at Dahlgren right now, both on air unmanned aerial vehicles as well as ground vehicles. Dahlgren supports the Marine Corps as well, and the Marine Corps still does a lot of things on the ground. Uh, the vehicle in the upper right-hand corner is called GUS. It is the ground <coughs> unmanned support system. Uh, and it's basically something where if the Marines get tired, they can throw all their backpacks on this and just walk along, and it'll follow them down the road, and they don't have to carry a lot of heavy stuff with them. That's the idea anyway. I think that one's still under development. Uh, so who doesn't like lasers? Uh, Dahlgren is on the cutting edge of some of the laser weapon systems that are being developed, specifically the laser weapon systems uh, called LAWS. Um, one of the big advantages with the laser weapon system is you don't have to carry a lot of ammunition around. You saw the size of that 16-inch shell in the earlier picture. Uh, the, the Navy uses five-inch shells now for most of their guns. They're still about this tall, about this big around, uh, weigh around 100 pounds. Uh, you can't store too many of them on the ship, um, and they're a lot harder to move around than to plug some cables in and start zapping stuff with a giant laser. Um, lasers have been very uh, difficult to develop into a weapon system because they require a lot of power, and it takes a lot. There's a lot of interference in the air, especially when you're on a ship. At sea, you've got clouds, folks, uh, smoke, mist, spray, all sorts of atmospheric interference. Uh, so there's a lot of research. The physicists and the mathematicians do a lot of modeling to figure out what frequencies we need to use and exactly how to pulse the laser to get the maximum effect out of it. Um, the other problem with the laser is you can only shoot what you can see, so you can't actually shoot over the horizon at anything. And with the speeds that some of the weapons move today, uh, you might only have a minute or two before something comes over the horizon before it's uh, in your way. Um, so again, I got over some of these challenges. Uh, one of the big challenges with lasers is getting them robust. Uh, lasers have been used in the lab for a long time, but we keep the labs nice and clean. Uh, we don't have a lot of explosions going off in our labs uh, most of the time. Actually, we haven't had an explosion in the lab for a long time. So. Uh, and uh, when we get about on the ships, the sailors aren't quite as careful as some of the scientists and engineers are with things, so we have to kind of make these more robust. Um, I should also point out that we don't only use lasers to destroy things. In the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see uh, laser metal sintering, which is a form of 3D printing uh, that we're doing a lot of work with at Dahlgren as well, trying to find out if we can manufacture parts out of it that are as good as the parts that we get uh, for many thousands of dollars from other contractors. One of the problems we have with weapon systems is we have to build spare parts for them, store them for a long time, and uh, that takes time, money, and logistics. If we can manufacture the parts as we need them, we can save a lot. And uh, everybody agrees we need to save as much money as we can on the defense expenditures. Uh, another system that is well known at Dahlgren is the electromagnetic <coughs> railgun system. Uh, again, this is, is where we're going instead of guns that use gunpowder, which is technology that goes back possibly as far as a thousand years ago to the Chinese, uh, certainly hundreds of years ago. Um, we're still using similar propellant technology. There have been a lot of advances in the chemistry and the mechanics of the guns and so forth, but it's still the same basic propellant mechanism. Uh, the rail gun uses electricity. Again, no need to carry energetics, flammable materials, there have been a number of accidents on ships involving magazines that have uh, caught fire, exploded, and destroyed ships. With a rail gun, you don't have any of that. You just have a giant magnet capacitors, a big generator on the ship, and you can fire these things out at seven times the speed of sound, um, and they'll, they'll go much further than a traditional projectile, uh, up to 100 miles. Uh, so, I would be remiss, since you're all scientists, budding scientists and engineers, I'm going to give you a little science lesson here in how the rail gun works. Um, so when you run electricity through a conductor, it generates a magnetic field around the conductor. If you have two conductors parallel to each other, and the electricity is running in opposite direction, the magnetic fields line up, and those conductors repel each other. In the rail gun, we strap those down in a solid container, and have one small piece that slides out called the armature and that pushes the projectile at the end of the weapon. 
Uh, down at the bottom, on the right, you can see the lines of magnetic force that coil around there. Unfortunately, they drew the line of magnetic force going down around the projectile. It actually should be coming up, otherwise the projectile would get sucked back into the barrel. Um, this is just more evidence that you can't believe everything you read on the internet. Um, but if you really want to explain to non-scientists and engineers how railgun works, just say electromagnetics. Um, so the railgun has a lot of technical challenges. There are millions of amps of current flowing through the rails and through a sliding projectile as it's moving down the barrel at several times the speed of sound. Uh, that presents tremendous materials challenges. Uh, one of my colleagues has done a lot of work characterizing the burned up rails and pieces of melted metal that result when the railgun doesn't work quite how we expect it to. Um, down in the lower left you can see that the projectiles inside of a sabot, a, a guide, and then there's a big armature on the back. Um, and on the right you can see some of the pictures. Um, people always look at that and think it's some sort of rocket. The, um, Illumination you see there is simply the friction in the air is so extreme that the air incandesces. It glows because of the, uh, the railgun projectiles moving through the air so fast. Similar to what you would see in a re-entry of the rocket, where it's moving so fast that the friction of the air causes it to glow. Um, in the upper left-hand corner in the group on the lower right, you can see that blue flash behind it. That's actually air, probably mostly oxygen fluorescent. So, part of my job as a representative of Dahlgren is to tell you all how great it is to work at Dahlgren and what kinds of people that Dahlgren hires. Uh, you can see there's a lot of engineer, electrical engineers, computer scientists, mathematicians, uh, mechanical engineers. Um, later I have a slide where I kind of listed the disciplines of everybody I know. Um, there's about 3,700 civilian employees at Dahlgren. There's a few hundred uh, military. Uh, we hire a lot of people across the range of educations. Um, and uh, we're really looking, they're constantly looking for new people to hire. Uh, to be honest, a lot of my colleagues are really old and they want to retire. So any of you that want to come work at Dahlgren, that's one of us that gets to go sit on the beach. Um, so here's uh, an example. Um, I work in the Chem Bio Defense Group, so we have a lot of biologists, virologists, microbiologists. Um, I do some material science as well. We've actually hired several material scientists recently. Um, we do a lot of work with trying to, so the, the marine environment is very hard on materials. Um, one of the things I've worked on is encapsulating electronics so that they can survive. Uh, if anybody's ever dropped their cell phone in the bathroom, uh, you know that sometimes they don't survive exposure to moisture no matter how quick it is. Uh, so we're working on ways so that the military systems don't have that problem. Um, fortunately, most of them are too big to fit in the bathroom. So. And uh, that's the uh, initial part of the talk I have. Uh, does anybody have any questions about anything I've gone over here? I've got a few backup slides I'll get through after this, and I'll talk about some of the STEM outreach we do. Uh, but does anybody have any questions about any of the systems I've talked about? Yes. Yes, um, so if you look at the image, you can see there's a distortion there. Uh, normally we think of air as an incompressible medium when we fly an airplane at normal velocities through it. Since these are moving faster than sound, that means they're moving faster than the air can get out of the way. And that air is compressing so much that it has a different refractive index. Uh, so when you look through it, it's almost like you're looking through a glass or some curved uh, piece of transparent material, and you can see the distortion there from the shockwave. Um, it's kind of interesting to watch the videos. Um, you can see the shockwave moving along uh, very distinctly in front of the projectile. You get a nice shockwave at Mach 7. Yes? So that's a good question. Um, and I was looking, uh, when I was preparing this talk, I was looking at the accuracy of some of the uh, weapon systems that were used in World War II. And they were usually hitting the target, uh, if it was within visual range, about a third of the time. 
And when they were shooting at something that was out of visual range, it was more like 1 or 2% of the time. Um, we would have the same issue with this. One of the advantages this has is it moves so much faster that any sort of crosswind or something is going to have less of an effect on it. Um, but if you're shooting at something 100 miles away, you're going to need some sort of guidance system on it. So unless something is relatively close, you would need to put some sort of guidance in here. So if you can imagine this thing is accelerating at somewhere between 60,000 and 100,000 Gs, and you need to have some sort of electronics and a power system, a battery of some kind, that's going to withstand that sort of crushing force as it's ejected out of the barrel and still be able to operate for the next 20 or 30 seconds before it gets its target 100 miles away. Uh, so that's one of the challenges um, and that's one of the reasons why we're kind of at the cutting edge with a lot of electronics and materials. Uh, yes? So when we do the calculations, the question was, could we make it smaller? Uh, so if you can see, he's holding this in his hand. That's a fairly small projectile. One of the key points uh, in trying to do these kinetic weapons is that you want to dump as much energy as you can onto the target. So the equation for kinetic energy is mass times the velocity squared. So obviously you want to get the velocity as high as possible. Unfortunately, if you get the velocity too high, your projectiles tend to melt and deform, and then they don't fly very well. Um, so then the only uh, alternative you have is to put more mass in there. They're making these out of tungsten, which is an extremely hard and dense material. Um, but if they want to dump 32 megajoules or 64 megajoules or 200 megajoules on a target, they still need to have 20 or 30 kilograms of mass in order to do that, even at Mach 7. Uh, yes, in the back. Why does it cost a million dollars to fly one missile? Uh, I think the Tim Kane was probably asking uh, the DOD people that uh, the last defense committee hearings. Um, missiles are really complicated. They have a lot of moving parts. The rocket motors in them are expensive to make. They have a lot of expensive electronics. Most of them have entire radar systems built into the missile so it can find the target. Uh, they just have a lot of stuff in them. Now, your cell phone probably has electronics that are as sophisticated as what's in a missile. Problem is, is that companies that make your cell phone make a hundred million of them every year. We only make a few thousand of the missiles. Uh, so there's something called an economy of scale, and a lot of military products never get to take advantage of that. One of the things that I didn't mention about the laser system is they're trying to use commercial lasers to make that system in order to keep the cost down. So the lasers that they're using to weld together cars, they're getting a bunch of those and putting them together to make one big laser. Yes, Ray in the back. Uh, can you repeat that a little louder? Yes, we can use the technology scale. We do have a number of rocket programs uh, that we use. The primary weapons on most ships are rockets or missiles of some sort. Um, we do use, they do use a lot of solid fuel rockets. Uh, the problem with the solid fuel rockets is a little harder to control. Um, take a couple more questions if anybody has any, and then we'll go through, and I'll talk a little bit about the steps. So I see two, more, two or three more hands up. So in front, a blue shirt. Uh, a little louder. What is the laser? What is it for? So one of the problems that we have with ships, ships are really expensive, they cost billions of dollars, and you wouldn't want somebody to be able to shoot a million dollar missile at your ten million dollar ship and sink it. So if we have a couple hundred million dollars worth of laser on there, we can shoot down those, those missiles or UAVs or anything else that comes close to the ship. Um, the lasers aren't quite at that point. They can shoot down UAVs, and a lot of times they'll use UAVs to target, to shine a laser or something off the ship so that the weapon can see it better. Uh, yes, lecture. So the current uh, electromagnetic railgun. Um, 
puts out 32 megajoules of energy. Um, they were shooting it at uh, foot-thick concrete blocks and shooting through about six of those. Uh, when they shoot them at steel plates, they can go through something like six to eight inches of steel. Probably more than that, but at some point they stop telling me how well it works. <laughs> yes? I would not bet against uh, the ingenuity of humans to miniaturize anything. Um, that picture I showed you of Grace Hopper standing next to the computer, that was one of about 30 or 40 cabinets that size that made up that computer. That computer was delivered in about 1943 or 4, which was about 70 years ago. Um, now, I have a cell phone that has about a thousand times, maybe 10,000 times the processing power. That's way smaller and fits in my pocket. Um, so 70 years from now, it's certainly feasible that somebody could create a power source small enough and materials strong enough to have a handheld rail gun. I think it's probably in the realm of science fiction at that point, but I would not say that it's technically impossible. Yes? Uh, a little louder. How does the laser system work? How does it work? So, this laser system is what they call a fiber optic laser, and it uses glass fibers that are doped with rare earth elements. I think these are erbium doped. And they flash a light on them, and when they do that, it excites the erbium atoms, and then when the, by the electrons get excited to a higher energy level, well, then they fall down to a lower energy level, and they emit photons that bounce back and forth inside the, and recirculate inside the fibers, and that excites more, and more of them uh, drop down, and it converts all of that flash into a very tight, tiny uh, beam of light that's then guided through the fiber. Now, if you take a few thousand of these fibers and you put them into an optical combiner, and then you take a few groups of those and you put them into a director head, you can get thousands of watts of power focused on a very small area. And if it's the right wavelength, it doesn't bounce off, it'll get absorbed, and it'll cause whatever it's shining on to superheat, evaporate, and essentially explode. Yes? How quickly does the railgun overheat when compared to typical naval cannons? So, um, the latest unclassified data I have <laughs> is that they could run hundreds of shots through the railgun before it would essentially wear out. Um, I know the Navy's goal is thousands of shots. A typical uh, five-inch gun barrel can fire between five and 10,000 shots before they replace the barrel. Um, so if the railgun could do something equivalent, then I think they would be happy with the longevity. Yes, in the back. Uh, black shirt. And... So there is a way that the technology can the railgun to be more efficient. So people have actually talked about doing that, uh, using a railgun to launch small satellites into orbit. Uh, that's certainly feasible. Again, you have the same problem we have with the railgun of putting a guidance system on it. You need to build a satellite that can withstand 60,000 to 100,000 Gs of acceleration. So, well, we could probably do that with some things. Um, it's still uh, easier, it's an easier engineering problem to launch satellites the conventional way, uh, especially with Elon Musk out there stealing all the business. Uh, blue shirt, yes. Uh, so rockets tend to be subsonic until they're pretty far away. Uh, the railgun sounds an awful lot like a regular gun going off. Uh, they'll often fire it several times at Dahlgren, and um, when I first started working at Dahlgren, it was uh, summertime, and I was driving past the end of the main range with my windows down, you know, headed back to the lab after lunch, and there was this huge bang, I was, almost drove off the road, because they were testing a five-inch gun um, a few hundred yards from where I was driving you know, on the range, uh, not pointed inland, unfortunately. Um, 
And when I've been uh, outside when the railgun's fired, it's very similar. So the volume, they actually, before they allowed them to do the railgun test, they put microphones out all over base to measure the sound levels to make sure that they weren't exceeding any OSHA regulations for uh, being too loud, essentially. And buildings close to where the railgun is, they'll, they blow a warning siren in to let people know to go inside if they're concerned about the noise. Uh, yes? Does the railgun fire every projectile at the same speed, or can it fire potentially slower? So it has a pulse-shaping network that can dump different amounts of energy in. So they could theoretically fire it at different speeds by controlling how high they charge the capacitors and how long the pulse is versus a shorter pulse. Yes? Uh, you have to speak up. So the amount of electricity used to fire the railgun probably costs uh, less than a dollar. Uh, the projectiles themselves, um, so the projectiles they fire now are just uh, metal slugs. So they're probably a few hundred dollars. The most expensive part is the machining used to make them into the precise shape. Um, when they fire real projectiles, they're going to have a guidance system in there. And the anticipation is that's going to cost twenty or thirty thousand dollars because of the electronics and how that especially they have to be made. Yes, black shirt next to. Yep. Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, there is some concern about shooting satellites with the laser system, and one of the programs I've worked on little bit briefly was called HPASS, which was a system to create a database so that when you got ready to shoot the laser, it would check a big database of all the satellites we have and make sure that we didn't have a satellite that was close enough that you might accidentally shoot the satellite at. It's not a problem with blowing the satellite out of space so much as it would be a problem of melting all the sensors and antennas on the satellite and turning it into orbiting junk. Way in the back. How fast can the laser shoot? Well, light moves about 300,000, 300 million meters per second. Um, the, the laser isn't really uh, limited. That's the nice thing about the laser is you don't have to aim it. You just point it wherever it's going. We don't have anything that we're trying to shoot that moves anywhere near the speed of light. Um, the big uh, speed limitation on the laser is how fast you can move that turret. Um, so to spin 180 degrees, it might take a few seconds to do that. Um, so if you wanted to attack a ship, you might send something in from both sides, which is one of the reasons why most of the weapon systems on the Navy ships, there's two of them that are pointing in opposite directions. Red shirt in the middle. To be able to use it on a boat? You mean to shoot at a boat? Um, so, the real challenge is guidance for it. As far as putting it on a ship, uh, there is a plan, uh, and I don't, I don't know if, there's, if it's still uh, planned for this year or next year or in the future, but they are planning to try and put the railgun system on uh, what they call the littoral combat ship, which is a ship specially designed to operate in shallow water, closer to the shore. Um, the big problem with it is you've got all of the electronics, so the, the bank of capacitors and the uh, pulse forming network, all of the uh, inductors and other uh, components that shape the waveform, uh, probably take up a space about as big as the screen and maybe five or you know, 10 feet out from the screen. So whatever cubic volume that is, uh, that's how much space they take up in the current railgun. Um, one of the parts that they've been working very hard at, and I've heard they are happy with their solution, although I haven't heard any numbers. Again, some of this stuff the Navy doesn't want everybody to know. Um, they've gotten that much smaller. I don't know how much much smaller it is. But if you look at um, a cutaway view of a battleship, and I don't have one to show you, but the, the gun emplacements on those battleships took up a space that was probably, you might fit four of them in this auditorium. Um, so it's, 
So imagine a battleship turret that takes up a quarter of this auditorium, and if you were to replace it with a rail gun, it would probably be comparable in size, but you had all the equipment and cooling systems and everything combined. In the yellow shirt. So, if it weren't shielded, it probably would. Uh, the nice thing about Navy ships is they tend to make them out of steel, and steel is pretty good at limiting the uh, magnetic uh, penetration into sensitive systems. Um, the Navy was worried uh, a lot about electromagnetic pulses from nuclear weapons uh, after World War II, so most of the Navy electronics are pretty well hardened against that sort of thing so the railgun wouldn't affect them. Plus, they've gotten away from using CRTs in their displays, finally. So you don't have the problem that you would have if you took a magnet up to an old TV set and make it all funky color. I'm going to go ahead and go through a couple of other slides that I've got to talk some, about some of the STEM outreach that we do at Dahlgren. Um, let's see if we can get to So uh, you were asking about rockets. So here's a small rocket system that was developed and designed at Dahlgren that was tested. Uh, here's a couple of more pictures of the rail gun. Uh, the, the littoral combat ship I was talking about uh, is one of the variants. They've designed several different ones that are competing. Uh, is in the upper right. Um, and then in the bottom, there's these modules that you kind of drop into the ship to change out the weaponry on it. That was one of the advances. Um, this is another picture of that scan eagle. Um, this is what the Navy calls man portable. It means you can move it with just one person. It's a little large for one person to haul around. I certainly wouldn't want to hike over the trail. Um, here's a ChemBio uh, slide. Again, um, I work in the ChemBio group, and the biologists there do a lot of work uh, with organisms. And when we come up when uh, new organisms like the Zika virus come out, there's often a lot of collaboration across the community to try and help out in identifying how the organism works and what can be done to minimize its effects or to uh, inoculate people against it. Um, there's some of the things you should be studying in school. Uh, so, this is an example of one of the STEM programs that we run in some of the local counties uh, where we, uh, we build Lego robotics kits to accomplish missions. Um, you can see that uh, there's a board that's got some accessories on it and some Mindstorms robots. Um, this program started in about 2005 and the Navy has invested a fair amount of money keeping it going and supplying materials as well as paying engineers to spend their time at the schools working with middle school students uh, in LEGO Robotics. So one of the advantages of working for Dahlgren and for the Navy is they'll pay you to play with LEGOs. Unless you work for LEGO, I don't think any other company is going to do that. Um, here's an example of some of the, the, the things that we do. Um, the first in the middle is uh, another robotics competition that we sponsor. Uh, sea Perch is building these small underwater vehicles that you can control. Um, and then uh, there's some other field trips that we run where we take people on tours through our facilities. Uh, we have a take your child to work day so employees can bring their kids in and see demos of some of the things we do in some of the labs. And occasionally, Dahlgren does have open houses where everybody can come. Um, any of the other uh, military research facilities, if you're near them, a lot of times they do have an open house during Armed Forces Week where you can go and take a tour and see some of the equipment. Um, so again, here's a list of some of the uh, STEM programs, uh, scholarships. Um, some of these are um, job programs where we can hire high school students or college students. So any of the you that are in college uh, can look into a co-op program um, with Dahlgren or with any of the, uh, either the Department of Defense Research Organizations or uh, Department of Energy, um, you know, Department of Commerce, they, they all have research. Uh, the Department of Commerce, for example, has the FCC, which is in charge of the radio spectrum. So they have a lot of electrical engineers that they hire to help with that. And uh, they have co-op programs. And I had a friend that was an electrical engineer that did a co-op program uh, with the Department of Commerce. Um, so here's some more of the uh, Dahlgren propaganda slides they put in here. I don't usually go through these, um, but uh, again, uh, 
Um, one of the advantages of working for the Navy is you're actually helping out in a very direct way uh, with the, the armed forces and helping to keep the troops safe and enable them to do their mission. Um, and here's some of the, uh, the special equipment that they have in Dahlgren and a list of various uh, types of materials they have. But that's about all I have for the presentation. Um, I don't know if I'm on a clock or um, if there's a specific time. I could stand up here and answer questions about science and technology for quite a while. Um, but I'll... Okay, well, we'll keep going with the questions. And at some point, a big hook will come and fall me off stage. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has about the research. Yes? Did I want to play? Uh, unfortunately, the guy that runs the big lasers, a friend of mine, is not here tonight, so I'm pretty much defenseless against large folks. Uh, yes, white shirt in the back there. Can any of the guns, uh, can any of the guns shoot up into space? Oh, yes. So. Um, other than the rail gun, none of the guns can, can fire a projectile fast enough to make it out of the atmosphere. Um, we do have a, a missile system that we have actually used to knock a satellite out of space. Um, I think there was some debate as to whether that actually removed junk or added junk to low Earth orbit. Uh, most of our missiles will only go to low Earth orbit, and the junk there tends to get slowed down by the atmosphere and fall back and burn up on re-entry. Um, the Navy does have a tracking system where they try and keep track of the hundreds of thousands of objects that are sort of baseball sized and larger. They're floating around after the last 50, 60, 70 years of space travel. Um, but uh, right now we don't have any uh, programs to remove any. Uh, that is something that people are very concerned about, though, because uh, the space station especially is an area of space where it will be very vulnerable to that sort of thing. Yes? Um, I suppose there's possibly a way to use the real gun to help gather the junk in space. I'm not really sure how that would work technically. Um, Usually you need something to collect the junk into one place, and the railgun tends to hit stuff and send it flying in all directions. So it may not be the best tool for that job. Uh, yes, so we're uh, If you are a lot of comments on this, actually, it might be classified. Who's the technology that you presented so far? Close to the people that I Well, so the laser weapon system is actually on a ship in the Persian Gulf now. Uh, there's only one of them, it's a prototype system. Um, usually they call these sorts of tests advanced concept technology demonstrators, ACTDs. Uh, that's when they take a prototype system that looks like it should work and has you know, had all of the stuff done to it so that it can survive on a ship without breaking. And they stick it out there and see what breaks because we never quite think of all the things that can break ahead of time. Um, the railgun is probably a close second because it is, um, again, discussions about putting it on a ship either in 2016 or 2017. Um, and the UAVs, um, those are out there. Uh, there have been a number of systems that have been fielded, and really that's, that's a rapidly evolving uh, technology that the Navy just is having a hard time keeping up with, uh, with all of the advances in uh, guidance systems and making the UAVs smaller and battery technology and engine technology giving them longer duration. Uh, so the, the Navy tends to want to buy a weapon system and keep it in place for a long time because it's expensive to train people how to use it. Um, it's not quite like every six months you want to buy a new cell phone just because they've got a better camera and Angry Birds runs faster. Navy can't afford to retrain people every six months, so they try to keep the weapon systems longer. Uh, but that's always a question as to when is it time to get rid of the old technology and transition. And I think they're going through that with the, ra the railgun system and the laser system with these directed energy. Yes? Uh, is possible to use for a ship so that we can 
So originally, it was actually mounted on a shore facility at Dahlgren, and they were shooting out into the water at the targets that were going by. Um, there's nothing that inherently limits it to ships, although they've spent a lot of time and energy making it robust enough to survive on a ship. Ships tend to uh, uh, rock around, and when uh, the waves get up, there's a lot of pounding and vibration and shock. Um, so if it survives on a ship, it would certainly be able to survive on the shore. Yes? Uh, the yeah, so there's a lot of different um, techniques that have been talked about for defending against lasers. Um, so the interesting thing about light um, so light's an electromagnetic wave, and it interacts with the electrons in matter. And metals have a lot of electrons, so they tend to reflect the light. So there was an idea that if you, for example, covered your missile with a shiny chrome coating, not only would it look really cool, but it would bounce lasers off. Well, all we have to do is change the frequency of the laser so that it doesn't bounce off anymore. So, there's a lot of ideas with respect to, so, um, one of the laser technologies that's not really ready to field yet, that's still in the very experimental stages, is something called a free electron laser. Um, and it's essentially a particle accelerator that accelerates electrons through a um, kind of a sawtooth electromagnetic field, and the electrons vibrate as they go through. And if you accelerate the electrons so that they're going nearly the speed of light, they vibrate at a frequency that produces um, coherent light coming out of the end of this free electron laser. Um, the nice thing about that is, is if you change the speed of the electrons, you can change the frequency of the laser. It's tunable. That way, if you're shooting at something and you're not having an effect, you can dial a, do a knob or have a computer automatically adjust so that you find whatever frequency um, that thing absorbs at and hit it with that. Um, almost everything absorbs at some frequency. There's, there's, there's really nothing. Everything has electrons in it, so it, everything interacts with some electromagnetic radiation at some frequency. Yes? Deflection? So, one of the other ways people have talked about uh, dispersing a laser, protecting its laser, would be to cover the outside with something like cork. So if you've ever taken a magnifying glass and tried to burn a hole in a log with it, I'm sure none of you have ever done that. Terribly dangerous. Um, it creates a lot of smoke, and that smoke will then block the light, and then it'll cool off, and then it'll start smoking again, and then it'll cool off. Well, that would happen with a laser if you had an ablative material, something that would burn off and create a big plume of smoke. Problem is most of the things we're shooting at are moving pretty fast, so that smoke is going to get left in the dust. Um, the other idea people have is if they rotate the whatever you're shooting at, you're shooting at the side, the laser won't stay in one spot long enough to heat it up to do much damage. Um, the people that design the lasers always say the solution to that is more laser power. So, hence, we're going to 30 kilowatt, 100 kilowatt, who knows how many watts of lasers in the future. Yes. How can you make sure that the enemy doesn't steal what you guys are working on at Dahlgren? Okay. Um, the question was, how do, you, how do we keep the enemy from stealing what we work on at Dahlgren? Um, we actually go to what they call counterintelligence training courses about twice a year. And we have a guy from NCIS that comes in and gives us a, a nice little speech about um, not posting what we work on on Facebook and not talking about it with strange people in bars and all sorts of other useful advice. Uh, seriously, there are there's a whole uh, arm of the Navy and most DOD organizations, um, as well as I'm sure some of you might have heard of NSA. Um, they're constantly monitoring what our adversaries or potential adversaries are doing to make sure that we're not leaking information to them inadvertently about these uh, systems. Um, one of the advantages we've always had in the past in the United States is we've had a very robust scientific community 
that's been able to develop things faster than anybody else. So a lot of the computer technology and the internet was invented and developed in the United States. And that was one of the reasons we were the leading uh, country for computing and computer science and so forth for many, many years. Now a number of other countries have caught up with us and we don't do as much manufacturing, but we still have some of the leading computer scientists in the world. The same is true of physics and chemistry and many other places. So what we try to do, I think the best defense against that is to try and stay ahead of the curve and be the smartest and most active scientists around. Uh, that way we can always develop something better when people learn our secrets.